Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. Mr. Gary. John, how are you? Doing pretty good. Yeah. Good. good. Glad to hear that. Yeah, we got quite a show coming up today. I mean, yeah, and, uh, and it, I, I, I've got I got to throw one thing oh, in a, a historical fact. You got a date? So, All right. So 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 we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about Tesla today. Yes. I know, right? Yes. It just so happens that on June twenty second, twenty twelve. Okay, so today is June twenty second. For those who are watching live, um, June twenty second, twenty twelve was the first delivery of the Model S at the Fremont plant. Wow. And a couple of weeks before he delivered those vehicles, Elon, who then was CEO and chief product architect, and as you well know, now he's CEO and techno king, said, quote, in 2006, our plan was to build an electric sports car followed by an affordable electric sedan and reduce our dependence on oil. Delivering Model S is a key part of that plan and represents Tesla's transition to a mass production automaker and the most compelling car company of the 21st century. So it seems to me that he's checked the box in terms of being a mass manufacturer, and he seems to have checked the box in terms of being most compelling. Yeah, yeah. And uh, preeminent automaker, too, possibly in this country. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. In fact, we're, we're going to talk a lot about that because we've got two executives from a company called Carasoft. They do teardowns and competitive benchmarking and analysis. We've got the CEO of the company, Matthew Vachaparampil. Matthew, great to have you on the show here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for and hosting. We've, and we've got Terry Wachowski, too, who's also at the company, a vice president there, I believe, right? Do, do I have that right, Terry? President yes. of Carousel. All right. President of Carousel. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So uh, at least I was when I went on vacation. I don't know yeah, if it's yeah. still the case. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I love having you guys on the show and you were on a couple of years ago before COVID and everything like that when we were in the studio and the company has grown so much since then. Uh, it, it, it's extraordinary to me uh, the, the growth that we've been able to see since Matthew, you were first on the show and, and now coming back on and uh, some of your insights that you've, you've come up with, I find uh I'm not just going to say fascinating, illuminating, educating. I mean, I've learned so much from you guys. And that's why I love having people like you on the show, because I know our audience is going to learn so much from you as well. So, so, so Matthew, give us, give us a, a elevator pitch of what Caresoft does. Well, uh, Caresoft is first and foremost, and uh, we founded in 2007, we have an engineering company and we entered the benchmarking space in 2017 with a patented technology where we CT scanned vehicles to get the CAD and CAE data. And uh, during the journey in benchmarking, uh, we have now uh, with the EV revolution that's happening, uh, we're benchmarking several vehicles and more than data, customers are looking for knowledge and actionable results and ideas on how to improve technology and reduce cost so that's what we do right now. Tremendous focus, especially on electrification and new technologies. Matthew, go into that CT scan because you just said, oh, we do the CT scan. But I mean, <laughs> you're essentially in a way doing an MRI of a vehicle where you can bombard it with all kinds of energy and, and literally replicate it in CAD. Yes. Yes, John, that's what we do. And uh, we do a process of... Uh, uh, reconstruction, it's, it's a process by which you take over 10 million images, uh, both in the X and Y axis and Z axis, and then we reconstruct those images, then we segment them for material properties and then get the CAD. And then we also tear down the vehicles and do a material analysis on every component so that we can uh, model the entire CAE model of the vehicle. So that's what we do. That's, that's the patented technology that we have. And John, John, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had an incident with one of my horses. We were shooing the horse and he uh, got spooked and, and ran into me. And uh, it, it's like getting hit by a Silverado. And uh, I went to the, the doctors, get my hand uh, fixed up and my chest really hurt. And uh, they did a CAT scan, to, an X-ray and this CAT scan to see if I had any broken bones. So they took the CAT scan and they were able to look at the image and say, well, it doesn't seem to be broken. 
if we would have done the CAT scan, we could have engineered a new rib for me. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have had the math data. We could have we could have 3D printed a rib and it would have been much better. So we take the technology and take it to where we can actually get engineering data from the data, from the, the visualization. So Terry, well, a little bit of your background too. You got uh, enormous uh, experience in the automotive industry. You were at General Motors for how long? Uh, about 34 years. Yeah, 34 yeah. years. And now, yeah. now you're doing this teardown and benchmarking and you've got some real lessons here, right? I mean, you know, companies, the, the startups, and we'll use Tesla as the best example for now. We'll get yeah. into some of the others later, but they do things differently than the way you did it in GM, right? Yeah, incredible. That's that's the biggest, the most amazing part of the whole thing. It's, it's, you know, the technology is intriguing, but the uh, the process, the culture of the companies, the way they go about the work is staggering, quite frankly. The speed at which they make decisions and the speed at which they execute is really remarkable. So, so Terry, give, give us a benchmark. So, so back in the day when you read General Motors, how long did it take from idea to execution of a vehicle? You know, we used to back at going way back in my career, you know, it could have been five years of a vehicle development process to take a vehicle from the studio, you know, through to production. Of course, with Toyota and the Toyota manufacturing uh, system, you know, with all the Kaizen, all the, the synchronous systems work, shortening that was always our task shortening the VDP, get it. So get it from 52 uh, months to, to 40, get it down to 32. And so we were always compressing. Um, but even then, you know, it's very long. And, and if you really wanted to go super fast, what you simply did was got offline. You just got off the main line. You got a little skunk works going and, and you could do some things pretty remarkably fast. And in a sense, you know, a lot of the startups are like that. They're just a skunk works. They just sit there and they don't, um, they're not bogged down with, uh, with, uh, I'll say bureaucracy. I don't mean it so much as a pejorative, but just all the loops and hoops you have to jump through to get everybody lined up. Uh, when you look at Tesla as an example in the pace at which they executed some of the mega castings from the model three to the model Y and rear mega castings to the front mega castings, they were doing those in a matter of a year's time, a year's time, a year's time. Uh, back in the day, it had taken us more than a year to decide to do it, let alone to do it. So, you know, it's kind of an indication of how quickly they're going. Matthew, give us a little bit more background on the company. As you mentioned, uh, Kerasoft is an engineering company, but then you decided to get into benchmarking. Why did you start the company? And what was the pathway that led you to the benchmarking that you're doing? Uh, so the first question was, why did we start the company? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Everybody's got to do something, right? But you decided <laughs> to start a company. So I worked for Fiat Industrial for a long time. And then uh, what happened was, uh, was based in the Midwest. Uh, my wife got a fellowship at the University of California to do a fellowship for uh, fully paid. And uh, it was just the top 2% of the doctors in the United States. So we moved to California. Originally, they had, this was pre-COVID 2007. Uh, and uh, they said, okay, I could work remotely. Uh, but three months later, the HR, my boss got fired and my the HR person changed and they said, oh, oh no, 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 you cannot uh, work remotely. I had sold my house, had moved, and they said, you have to come back. I did this commute for every week and got old and then uh, quit. And then uh, we had one of my old bosses was uh, the CEO of the company. Uh, he said, hey, why don't you help me with some projects? And that's how we started an engineering project in uh, Illinois. Uh, it was uh, it, the company is now called. I, it's owned by Echo, and uh, started uh, started the first project. I still remember, and that's how we got it going. Uh, how did we enter benchmarking? So um, it was uh, actually purely a coincidence. I, I was living in San Diego, and the San Diego is the base of the Pacific Fleet, and um, a lot of the ships that go out to uh, the Middle East come back and the jets on the aircraft carriers they used to do non-destructive testing so the there's a big ct scanner which scans planes it's in san diego and then there's one near berkeley uh north of berkeley on the other side of the bay and uh at, at the university so i heard about this and um, that there was scanning and then uh, later when we move, moved back to Michigan, I studied in Michigan, I moved back after Anna's fellowship. 
Uh, well, we, 2015, uh, 14, we scanned a uh, steering knuckle, then we scanned an engine, and then 2016, we scanned the whole Tesla X and entered the benchmarking space. So uh, benchmark, uh, came in mainly with the CT scan with like a high-end product, and then uh, realized very quickly that the many of the CXOs did tell us like that uh, they were inundated with data, but they, what they were looking for were insights, ideas, actions, Hey, tell us what to do. Don't just give me data on 100 vehicles, competitive vehicles. Tell me on my vehicle what I should do. And then we came up with ideas to improve technology and reduce cost. And that's been the journey uh, so far. So in the last six years, uh, we almost have over 120 automotive customers. And then um, uh, we're over 100 million in revenue. Uh, but then we have technology centers in Europe, in, uh, in the US, in uh, Japan, in China in India, in the Middle East, and so on, and still expanding. So there's a lot of, with the electrification, everybody is eager to learn and uh, learn from the best. And uh, and the Chinese right now are doing very well. So that's kind of the journey we've had. So in, in terms of this scanning versus the physical disassembly of the vehicle, is, is there a balance in terms of the importance or is one more important than the other? Okay. So the, the, I think of, so oh, though we started with the scanning, uh, what's more important is to have uh, the whole idea of the scan data was to create the CAD and the CAE and to essentially that data allows us to do the following. If you make a change, you can see the impact on performance virtually. So that's the beauty of the high energy scan data. It gives you cause and effect in terms of changing a constraint. So if you have, so if I gave you the high energy scan data of the Tesla Y and we had a steel aluminum casting and you wanted to change the composition of the casting and with a different material, you could then see the impact on performance and you can also calculate the cost. Uh, but, um, engineering is all about design, uh, design, making the best design with the best performance for the lowest cost. So as engineers, we're always trying to optimize that equation between design, performance, and cost. And that's the point of the data. But um, uh, it's uh, it costs us around $3 million to scan and develop the whole data. So we also do teardowns where, uh, that's when uh, you know Terry joined us in 2018, is looking at teardowns, looking at the data and understanding, hey, why is something done a particular way? And why is something done a particular way? And what can we do about it? to make it technologically better or uh, lower the cost. So that's the balance between the two. It's not only just having this data, which is very powerful, but knowing what to do with it and why do we do, uh, what, why is a particular design better than the other? And what are all the interactions that go with it? Because a lot of these designs are compromises. Uh, you cannot just make a very good performing design because the cost will be, will go through the roof. Gary, it's sort of the right tool for the right job. Mm -hmm. If it's a real high tech job where we really need that uh, uh, CAE type work and you got to do simulation and that type of thing, that's the right tool. But if it's uh, to look and to find some cost reduction opportunities to uh, fortify the balance sheet, we can do that with a, a physical teardown or we can do that even in math. We can just do that with designs prior to release and, and do the benchmarking and cost reduction ideation. Well, let's show the audience some of what you're talking about here, because Matthew, you were kind enough to send me a presentation that you've done, uh, and, and we've got some pictures here. And uh, yeah, here's a good one that that Sean is, and Seamus have thrown up here, comparing the the body and white mass comparison. And uh, Terry, you know, walk us through these pictures here. What are we looking at? What we're looking at here is uh, a, a typical, you know, legacy OEM. Uh, if you look real close, you might be able to identify who it is, but you know, it's, it's very it's typical left -hand uh, side is, of, is the legacy uh, one, right? of a body in white. And, uh, and now when you look over at the, uh, in this case, uh, uh, Tesla Model Y, the latest uh, edition, and you can see just some just seismic differences in these two architectures. Uh, the one uh, typical, uh, where it's just, I call it almost a stick build, you know, you just bring all the pieces in, the sub-assemblies, and you sub-assemble those, and then you bring those together in a body shop, and, and uh, you know, through great painstaking work for, to get uh, tolerancing, uh, you know, accuracy, 
build a body. Well, here you can see that uh, uh, with the, the Tesla, by introducing the mega castings, both the rear and then the front, uh, and then even going even beyond that and having the battery instead of just being redundant metal, but being having the battery be structural to the body, uh, they ultimately uh, they're achieving a great uh, a percentage in, of efficiency improvements. And when you look at the body and weight as a function of mass, you know, the mass of the vehicle, how much of the vehicle mass is the body? And you can see the uh, huge reduction uh, in the amount of mass that you have to carry around just to keep water off the electronics, if you would. So this is uh, uh, it's just a great example of Especially in an EV, mass is so critically important from a parasitic loss perspective, and as it a, a function of range and a function of the cost of the batteries to get effective range, you, you have to go after every kilo, and this is a great, great way to do that. Yeah, but, I, I'm but, guessing that one on the left is a Jeep. I don't know. Somehow that just seems. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm guessing I'll, wrong, huh? I'll, I'll protect them, didn't I? Okay, uh, <laughs> right. but it's, it's it's a very you know it's it's a a top tier. Uh, auto supplier it's very they're excellent but you can see you know with the with the model y the, the idea of having a body and white come out of a body shop without a floor it's like well that's that's kind of crazy but when you look at it and say well i have this big piece of sheet metal for a floor and then i have an almost identical piece of sheet metal this far below it as the top of the battery it's like why do i need both of these and the truth is you don't uh, if you do it right. Now you may have to increase and did increase the the battery cover in order to be structural, but on net, you know, over a 14% reduction or efficiency improvement. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got to ask, so, so Matthew, you made the point that, you know, you could design something that, that's quite wonderful, but you can't make it because it's too expensive. And, you know, when I look at the legacy OEM, I'm wondering to what extent is it designed and engineered that way? because the tools they happen to have in a factory are capable of doing it that way and not capable of doing it the way that Tesla does. Well, I think, uh, I, I think it goes back to, uh, it, I think Gary, it, it, it's not so much about manufacturing and the competency. I think it goes back to what Terry asked, uh, which is very subtle and is, did we design it to first principles and to ask the question, why do you have a floor on the body in white? And why do you have a top cover on the battery? And there's like 10 millimeters of space between the two. Why do you need two? So it's the first principles design thinking there. And what's very, very important is to realize, and we, Terry alluded to that earlier, uh, the speed at which Tesla moves and the way they are structured. So even in Fremont, what we hear in spoken to several Tesla people is, uh, design and manufacturing is very integrated. There's manufacturing in the plant, design is very close by. So uh, the ability to talk to each other and say, hey, why, and make those changes. Uh, traditional legacy OEMs have these big silos and they have processes. These processes uh, are over the last 50, it's like in any industry, right? And if you go to uh, Michael Porter or Clayton Christensen, it goes back to as an industry matures, commoditization happens. When commoditization happens, organization gets very structured and very process oriented. What you see with Tesla is uh, they are able to innovate. They, they, have, do, they have processes, but they're able to innovate uh, uh, and do more than Kaizen. They're able to do these huge revolutionary changes which speaks to the culture of the organization. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that is the critical thing. It's allowing the freedom to think and innovate. Whereas in a traditional OEM, like Terry said, you know, it'll take you one year to even make a decision. I would go further and even ask question is in certain organizations in the world that we work with, if you came up with such an idea, you could even be fired. Uh, we run into that all the time. There are certain engineers are scared yeah. to suggest because they said, if you broke the specification of the golden rules in that organization, you could be fired. Hey, Matthew, go back to first principles a bit. I know a lot of our audience is familiar with uh, first principles, the concept, but there's probably mm -hmm. people watching that are not familiar with the concept. And it's a really key one. So just simply explain what you mean by that. So first principles is to look at the physics of the design, 
and to understand uh, uh, what you have done and why you have done it and uh, what what is the bare basic that you need to do to make this functional. So I'll give you an example, if you could, I don't know whether you have a picture on the hoses or the wires or any of those, uh, it's to challenge the existing requirements ask uh, we could, if you could go further down to like uh, the, where the hoses are, or or say, say for example here, this is a good example. Uh, if you look at the Model X uh, on the left, which is uh, uh, legacy design with domain controllers all over the place, ECUs, and then if you go to the best in class, which is right now is Tesla Y, where they put two body control modules on the left and try to centralize all the functions. It's asking why do we need different controllers for powertrain and body and steering and so on. Why can't we integrate this into one box and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, make it technologically more advanced and, and drive more functionality, which in turn means lower cost and uh, so on. So, the, uh, the, so th those are looking at things from first principles and saying, yeah. and if you take this further is, hey, how do we you have power and signal distribution happening. Is there a way I can take power out separately and run signal wirelessly or run it on ethernet? So these are all the things because technology is changing all along and we have to re go back and check, okay, is there a better way today than yesterday? Yeah. Now, this is a good example. And I think Terry, would you like to explain this from first principles, I think? Well, you know, again, and Gary, your, your question is a really good one because, you know, we've, we've, inst we've, come up with processes and manufacturing, you know, uh, layouts and things over the last hundred years. And so you kind of do get in a groove. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, in an internal combustion engine, you are exploding gasoline in a cylinder and, and we're harvesting some of the power from that. Well, there's a lot of rejected heat uh, in that. And so they get really hot and it would ruin the machine. So we have to cool them, but the coolant gets so hot that it'll boil. And so we have to pressurize it so that it won't boil. That's why your dad told you, don't take the radiator cap off when it's hot. It was good advice. Don't do that. It's pressure. Um, well, we've typically have, have the industry has been centered around about a 21 PSI pressurization to have a good, solid, robust cooling system. Well, then when you look in the uh, evolution to EVs, you notice that um, many people maintain a 21 PSI system because they've always engineered cooling systems at 21 PSI. But from a first principles perspective, we're not burning gasoline. We're just harvesting some energy we stored in the battery and we're, we're bleeding it off forward. And, and it just never gets that hot. It doesn't get hot enough to, to get to that kind of uh, you know, elevated coolant. And so you don't need a 21 PSI system. A 5 PSI system is, is plenty, which means now the material that you make your hoses of, the thickness of them, the mass of them, the cost of them, how they are connected, all those things start to get affected by uh, the first principles of, hey, what does this thing really need to do? And uh, and so some are, you know, adopted the first principles and just went went off and did this. Others uh, maintain their their legacy, their history, and will slowly be uh, evolving to this. But there can be ten dollars of cost. It can be five times that, depending on the complexity of your cooling system. So we're not talking you know small amounts of money here. There's a, there's a lot associated to the to the earlier question uh, with the body, you know. One thing that we talked about at, at CareSoft is uh, industrial anthropology. You look at this, this teardown enough, I can draw the company's org chart. You look at the product, you can tell how they're organized. And you can tell something about their vehicle development process, what comes first and what, what comes second. Uh, you can just tell by looking at the product. When you look at the Tesla and the floor, the integrated the floor, the structural battery, typically, and it, it's compared to the traditional why does the traditional one have a floor? Because it's a body and the body group engineers it. When the body group engineers you a body, by gosh, it'll have a floor. You know, it'll, you will be encased. You will be safe. They'll do silo drop. They'll do crush. They'll do all torsion. They'll do all kinds of things. There's your body. And if you get a battery designed by a battery group, believe me, it's going to Freddie Kilowatt lives in there and he's not getting out. Man, we got him <laughs> secured and, and, and he's safe and, you know, it's going to work well. 
So those are two very different groups and they do their work down their own work streams. And then somebody comes in at body drop and marries them together. Integration is the key to efficiency and integration is hard work because you have to get people who can work across their, their boundaries and across their traditional limits. And uh, boy, the beauty is in the integration. And then the more you can do that, the more efficient. If you don't integrate well, your design won't be well integrated and it won't be very efficient. And this is a, the age of efficiency. So it's critical. So Matthew, how, did, how do legacy automakers deal with this? They're organized in silos. I mean, the whole company is organized in different. You got design, you got engineering, you got manufacturing, you got procurement and so on and so forth. But even if you look inside the engineering department, just what Terry's talking about, you got powertrain, you got chassis, you got suspension, you got body, blah, 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 blah. Matthew, can the legacies even come up with this total systems approach to engineering uh, the way they're doing it now? And can they even change to have an organizational structure that allows them to do that? Okay. So I think, uh, I think before we look at the engineering organization or look at the, um, you know, the silos and powertrain and so on, uh, John, uh, there are certain fundamental questions that we have asked, we've got to ask. Okay. So a company or an organization is a bunch of people, the leader, and uh, uh, all human beings at the end of the day. And the first step to understand is, hey, does the leadership of the company see a reason to change? Because without understanding the reason to change, uh, we can talk about this a lot, but nothing's gonna change. So the first step is to recognize point number one, that the environment is changing, okay? Point number two, because the environment is changing, there is a threat to my survival, both short and long term. You know, there are basic human, all, uh, I'll give you two examples, very good examples that I think to contrast the situation. Uh, you had companies like Nokia, okay, didn't change with the environment or Blackberry. But then you have a company like Microsoft which Bill Gates in the 90s said, you know, Microsoft is the it and I will not work on the internet and internet is outdated. And one fine day in the late 90s, he came and said, stop all projects and you work on the internet. And if you look at technology companies, Microsoft is one of the companies which was a relic in the 70s. You never expected deck, sun, everything has died. Microsoft has reinvented itself all the time with each leadership. Gates handed over to Bomber, Bomber handed over to Nadella, they reinvented themselves as a as a cloud company today, and now if you see they're back in the race with Chat GPT. Okay, so the point is they recognize the environment is changing. They see a risk to their survival, and if you see that, then you can go in and talk about driving. It's ultimately a leadership and a cultural issue. And before we even talk about the silos in engineering, are you integrating from a marketing perspective? with manufacturing, with engineering, with uh, sale, uh, with uh, uh, product support and so on. So just look at that body, which is a casting. I'm sure there were discussions in Tesla which said, hey, if you have a casting, you can't fix it in an accident. And somebody said, okay, if I'm going to save uh, 135 kilos and maybe $800 on each vehicle, and let's say we make a million vehicles, that's 800 million that we save. Uh, yes, you may have, say, out of the 1 million vehicles, maybe 50,000 vehicles crash. And out of that, maybe 5% you would change the casting, which could be a 20,000, uh, so 2,000, uh, 5%, 2,500 2, vehicles. And you may have to spend, say, $20,000, which is around 50 million. So here you save 800 million. Here you save 50,000. And the decision was made, which was good for the company, looking at marketing, sales, manufacturing, engineering, everything. So that... Terry talked about integration, looking at the integration of the organization, what's good for the company and not just one particular group drives these good, very, very holistic decisions. And that drives the same thing of breaking down these silos where like with the example of the body and the battery, uh, the breakdown, uh, breaking down the silos within powertrain and the body group. So uh, these are the changes, you know, it's more a cultural issue than just a technical issue because a lot of the engineers who are at Tesla 
or Lucid or West Coast. They're engineers from traditional OEMs anyway. So the technical background is still the same. It's not like people in Tesla are magically smarter. It's just that they're more open to these, uh, to a different way of working and a different process. Yeah, the, the, the system but, allows it. But but one of the things I wonder about is, is that if, if John or I were to talk to any executive at any of the OEMs, traditional OEMs, and were to say to them, you know, is, is change important? Is your company at risk? Are you moving ahead at light speed? They would answer, you know, we're on it. We're taking care of it. We're making change. We're, 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 you know, doing all the right things yet from what your documentation seems to indicate, that's really not happening. Well, the fear of change, the fear for survival is different among different OEMs. We work, I, the privilege of meeting with several CXOs. Some are really, really scared and see the change, you know, privately, they will say, hey, I'm scared of the future and they take decisive action. Some, uh, I don't think I even understand the seriousness of the problem that you're facing that the industry is truly in, uh, in, a, in an upheaval, especially in the uh, next uh, two to three years, especially with Tesla's plans to go to 20 million units. So, um, uh, it, it all depends on the individual and uh, then uh, so there's leadership so in addition you have this entire middle management who has to accept this change so do they feel the same pressure as the leadership are they exposed to it um, can they move as fast uh, so if you are somebody in the body group who has always done robotic welding and sorry stampings and robotic welding and so on and you're like three years from retirement, do you want to go and understand now how to build castings? Okay, so these are all the fears within, within people in an organization. Because change change is difficult, change is scary, and uh, that's what it's all about. Hey, uh, we and, and there, there, oh, Jerry, sorry, hold that thought one second. We've got to take a quick commercial break right here. We'll be back in 15 seconds. Hold that thought. We're going to come up to it again. Got to pay the bills. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on wet roads? It's their HydroTrack technology. But you don't have to know how the science works, just where the brake is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. Thank you, Bridgestone. We're back. And Terry, <laughs> pick it on up again. Well, Matthew, square on. I really like the, the answer. I would just add to it if I could a little bit. Number one is uh, you show me how you measure me, and I'll show you how I'm going to behave. Okay, so we have in, instilled metrics and measures of, of how we run the business today. And those are typically built around optimizing your particular uh, domain. But you may win in your domain and lose at the enterprise because you didn't uh, make a better trade off. And so, yeah, your, your part or your system may be uh, the lowest cost possible, but uh, had you done it another way, and maybe actually taking a little bit of cost on on net, you could have a much bigger cost reduction for the vehicle. So we have to look fundamentally, even just how we set up our, our organizations and how we measure ourselves uh, with respect to, um, you know, our performance. The other thing, and there's a little bit of a cliche, but I've learned it. I, I believe it's quite true, actually, more so than just a cliche. But especially as we transition to EVs, you know, there's a lot to learn. Absolutely. But I am convinced there's a lot to unlearn. And when you've been doing this for 30 years in your career, it's not easy to unlearn that. This is our process. This is my validation scheme. This is what my supplier's capabilities are. This is what we've done for the last 75 years. Now you want me to just throw all that away and, and go in a totally new direction. And, and that's tough. But these companies, they have, to, they have to learn. And they have to unlearn. And they have to do it fast. Hey, hey, because we've got a picture. A we got a picture from uh, your presentation, Sean. If you can bring up that cross car beam, I think it was page twelve, because I think this gets right to what you're talking about there, Terry. So, talk us through these. Th this is the the structural beam inside of the instrument panel. Runs from one side of the car to the other. You take it from there. Yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. The cross car beam is an important part. It's it goes between the A pillars. The entire instrument panel is mounted to it. The steering system, all the crash countermeasures, everything uh, attaches to it. It is a very difficult part 
to design uh, from a GD and T perspective. What's it, that GD and T? It's the geometric tolerancing and dimensions. Okay. It's to make sure it fits. And you know, they imagine the whole IP and all the pieces that come together they have to line up beautifully, right? And the craftsmanship is important. And these are usually stampings and weldments and, and they want to distort. So it's a tough thing to, to design. Well, uh, the some of the NEVs, uh, the new EV companies, uh, in this case, Tesla in particular, uh, came forward with a very simple cross car beam. It was a hydroformed aluminum tube poof, uh, with uh, co-injected plastic bracketry. Uh, and as you can see, a, a substantial reduction in overall mass of the part. And so uh, it's it's much easier for the operator. It's lighter, less parasitic loss for all the good reasons to do this. But when some of the uh, legacy engineers saw it uh, in physical, they picked it up. There it is. And, and their reaction was, and uh, I don't mean to be demeaning, but it was a little bit surprising. They simply looked at you and said, this won't work. But, and it's a little bit stunning because you say, well, we bought the car and we drove it here. Uh, it seemed to work and it gets a five-star crash rating. What do you mean it won't work? And then they go on to you know, respond, well, we have requirements. We have dynamic uh, bending requirements, modal analysis requirements that say it's, it's bending frequencies have to be above a certain target. That isn't. And so it won't work. It doesn't fit my specifications. But what they fail to realize is that those specifications were driven by the fact that you mounted a V6 engine or a four cylinder engine sideways that dynamically shake and in order to protect the passenger and the, and the drivers from this unwanted noise and vibration, we came up with those modal separations and impedance mismatches and torque axis mounting and all these schemes to make it nice and smooth and quiet. But this is an EV. It doesn't shake. It hums like a sewing machine. Uh, that requirement is no longer germane. And so to say the design won't work because it doesn't meet a requirement that doesn't pertain that's first principles you 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 you're you're bringing specifications onto a design that's not necessary in manufacturing we say overproduction is one of the eight forms of waste in engineering engineering to requirements that are over and above what's necessary to satisfy the requirements is a form of waste and uh, you know that's a lot that caresoft does is look for waste and identify ways that they can call that waste out and be more efficient in their design lower cost and, and that's what you mean by legacies have got to unlearn so many things. That's correct. Absolutely. So, so what I wonder about though is, is, is Terry and, and Matthew, um, this, this goes to a point you're talking about, um, sounds like permission that leadership has to give to people. So presumably Terry, that there are reams and reams of documents that are engineering requirements. Right. And if you're sure. an engineer, you, you've got to stick to those things because that's what it says. Right. So from what you're saying with the example of the cross car beam, um, having characteristics that are no longer required, no longer relevant, somebody has to be the one who says, we're going to throw those papers away. We're going to throw it all away and we're going to do it differently. We're going to go to first principle. Exactly. So at, exactly. at what point in leadership, who makes that decision? I'm, I'm sure that the, you know, that the, uh, the engineer who's, you know, given the assignment, he can't do that or she can't do that. There's got to be somebody higher right. up. Typically can't and almost always won't. Um, we're engineers. We engineer the requirements. We don't just engineer because it's fun. I mean, there are requirements, there are specifications and there's constraints. And we engineer within those constraints to our requirements and we bring forward a design that works. Engineers are risk adverse by our very nature and in the auto industry, especially because the failure mode effect of us doing something wrong can be devastating. You do something wrong, it can lead to fatality. It can lead to an illegal product, the campaigns, warranty, quality. You, you just don't make mistakes. And so our processes are built to protect us from that, to harden that. We have factors of safety and we have you know validation schemes, especially because we have we learned a lesson. Oh, we had a big problem. And so we hardened our, our process, we hardened our design. We'll never have that problem again. We, we continue to layer this on. Oftentimes that problem is gone, doesn't even exist, but the countermeasure stays, you know. So, so the processes that we uh, that we engineer to are, are very rigorous. 
the, the million dollar question that you just asked is who owns those and who has the authority to change them? And what has to happen is, is uh, they have to be involved. It, you have to, and through this benchmarking, you, you say, listen, they're engineering to different requirements than us. And it, either they're doing something wrong and they're going to have a big problem. Good. Let them have a problem. Or, man, we're, we're out to lunch on this. This is, you know, we're behind. We need to, to be changing those. And so that's, that, that's what they need to do. That's where their efficiency gains can come from oftentimes. Matthew, this gets back to what you were talking about of culture at a company. So important. And Sean, hold on, leave this slide up because I want to get to that in a second. But uh, Matthew, really what I'm getting out of this is it's going to be almost impossible for a legacy automaker to make these kind of changes unless they set up a totally separate group just to do like a startup within a legacy company. I, I, I'd love to get, you know, some of your thoughts along those lines. How, how do you change culture? And, and, you know, if you had a decade or so, maybe you could do some sort of transition, but the wolf is at the door right now. Okay. So uh, what in our experience with OEMs, if, uh, if the leadership understands the needs to change, uh, things move quite quickly. And uh, so a lot of the legacy automakers have a challenge on their hands. Right? So before I answer your question, we have to look at the environment. Uh, how do they fund these EV investments? Because there's a lot of development that needs to be done. There's batteries, plants, there's new plants to be built. You have to get that out of your life's business. So you need to generate the cash and so on. So, uh, so uh, there are different approaches. Some companies are doing it. So recognizing the need to change and to move fast that's point number one, okay? The structuring the organization and all those things is how to get it done. But first, why should we get it done and how soon should we get it done? Those are the fundamental questions too that the leadership needs to answer. And once you do that, then there are different models. So if you look at Ford, Ford has uh, decided to go with Model E and Ford Blue. Renault is going with Ampere and Horsch and so on, different approaches. And also leadership, so for example, in Ford, uh, Jim Farley has done an amazing job of bringing in Doug Field in, who's ex Tesla, ex Apple, and so on and so forth, who really uh, imbibes this sort of thinking of uh, the EV world and so on. So that's a very good example of uh, you know a different way of thinking uh, and so on. So within another two years, you should see some great changes in Ford on the Model E side uh, because of Doug's leadership. So, uh, because he's just been there a year or so. So that's one way. The other way is some of the OEMs are uh, doing that in an integrated fashion uh, and so on. Of the vehicles we have seen, uh, uh, you know, we don't, uh, uh, Terry, what do you think? Of the vehicles we have benchmarked, none is as revolutionary and radical as Tesla is so far from a legacy automaker. Would that be fair? Yeah, I, I Lucid is a very good, uh, very uh, excellent technical vehicle, uh, but the Tesla on net uh, definitely. And when you look at their projections with the uh, the manufacturing uh, approach that they're that they're embro you know, broaching on, absolutely by by a quantum. Yeah, but Terry, I mean, I'm the legacy automaker. I yeah. don't. I have not seen a vehicle that is uh, no. No. no Tesla no. Lucid. So we should see the effects of sales from Ford. One of the big things uh, you could see that with uh, Model E, and uh, you could see that now Renault is going the Ampere way, and so on and so forth. So, uh, 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 so which is the right answer? Time will tell, but definitely, as we have shown with examples, uh, developing an EV is about learning. Yeah. It's about unlearning, learning. It's a different way of thinking, uh, more like a tech company, uh, taking risks, moving fast, and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, in another two, three years, we'll know the answers on these uh, things, which time will tell. But uh, it is a challenge, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd, I'd say the, the old cliche that the best organizational structure is the next one. Uh, that's a, typically the, <laughs> the way we look at it. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to leadership. You, know, you can structure yourself every way and there'll be benefits in the, in the new way and there'll be some uh, shortcomings of it. But it's a matter of leadership. And I think one of the interesting things, and Matthew, you can expound on it, is in a lot of the uh, the new startups, the the top leadership, the senior leadership, are extremely technically competent people. 
they're not simply great business uh, uh, minds and financiers, but technically, I mean, listen to John Rollins talk about a battery cooling system and you're going to school. It's really amazing. So I think there's, you know, from a leadership perspective and having that that connectivity or product and the leading technologies is, is pretty critical. Hey, Sean, let's go back to that that slide I said to, to hold up because, I, you know, I love Peter, we're, Peter we're, we're jumping all around here. Right. But you guys have got such great findings in your, your presentations. Uh, Matthew, what are we looking at here? What, what, what's the importance of having on the right hand side? You see OEM2 and this sort of notch into the, the, the trunk area, the rear end of the vehicle. OK, so what you see on the left is a traditional legacy OEM, uh, which is uh, which where the your uh, floor and everything is a body shop, body panel. Uh, it's stamped and it's welded together, robotically welded and so on and so forth. So uh, on the right, you see the Tesla uh, Model Y uh, with the open rear end casting. Now you have the new ET5, the Z009. You have uh, Volvo's going to it several times. They're going to announce this week, they're going to do a rear casting, a rear and front casting. So what this does is if you're a, uh, if you're on the manufacturing floor, uh, this is what's called the golden zone. So if you could walk in and if you had to uh, assemble parts, be the sunroof or the rear seat or even uh, the both the, uh, uh, the carpet and everything inside the vehicle, you can walk in and do it. Whereas on the left, you have to jump in and out of the car or you need a uh, some sort of a robot or some sort of fixture to bring the parts in and so on. So. Uh, the integration that we see in Tesla between manufacturing and engineering uh, is huge. So that's the message here. And the question for legacy OEMs is: Hey, do you uh, do you have um, do you have an organization that encourages that sort of interactions and in and integration? And that's the critical piece. So uh, coming back. Uh, you know, some of these newer, uh, newer where the legacy OEMs have separate organizations, say uh, Model E, where there's a, uh, a lot of the people, if you see in Model E or even in Ampere, are from other companies. Uh, in Model E, for example, there's a lot of good talent. They are used to this so, sort of way, way of working. So, you know, in a year or two, we should see some great results from Model E uh, with this sort of thinking and approach. Mm -hmm. So, no, 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 I know John doesn't, doesn't, cotton to this, but I'm going to say it anyway. So um, the JD Power IQS study came out today. Okay. And they announced the results today. Now I remember years ago, and Terry, you'll maybe recall something like this. I was in the Kansas City assembly plant. There was a Malibu and it was completely covered with post-it notes with little things written on it. And it was all about JD Power results and they, you know, it's everybody in the plant had to look at that and see what's going on. Okay, so here's my point about the IQS. So Dodge came in first. They Which had stunning. They, they came, came in first? First. First. They had 140 problems <laughs> per 100 opportunities for problems. Okay? okay. The industry average is 190, 192. So less is better. Tesla is at 257. OK, so it seems to me that unlike a legacy automaker, and this is whether it's going to be Ford and Model E or whatever General Motors comes out with or Renault or anybody else, that Tesla gets a pass for some of the things that don't go right. The others are not going to get that pass. You know, I mean, even even if it's the same problem, you know, it's, it's, it's like the old thing about when. Uh, you know, before the, the Tesla plant was a Tesla plant, it was the Numi plant where they right. were building they were building Chevys and Corollas on the same line. Yep. And the Corolla was thought to be fantastic and the Chevy was eh, and they were the same car. So, you know, again, Toyota got the pass. Chevy didn't get the pass. I'd say that right now Tesla gets a pass. No one else gets a pass. So, I mean, how do we explain this, this you know, bad showing in the in the IQS study? Yeah, you know, back when I, at one time I was the global vice president of quality for GM. So I lived this. Part of my pay was predicated on, on how we did on such independent surveys. Uh, in fact, we drove to where we were number one back in back in the day. So uh, extremely important uh, focus. 
I think um, I, I think it's a bit of a, an Achilles heel for for uh, some of the startups. Uh, fit and finish isn't uh, all, all uh, isn't competitive in certain areas. But I, I'd put it to you this way: you know, it's taken people a, a hundred years to figure out how to fit put a, a door in a hole so that it fits well and there's no wind noise and there's no water leak and, and the sound quality on closing and all these things. It, there's a lot of, uh, you know, institutional knowledge on how to build a car that the startups don't have. They don't have decades and decades of having iterated through that and making better and better and better. So that's their learning curve. They, they don't come in as a center of all wisdom and knowledge. There's stuff that they have to learn how to do that. And they will continue to do that. And they have continued to do that. So um, how they get a pass, I don't know. You got a beta group for owners. You know, you got people who love the product and, and are willing to overlook some of those things. Um, and how long could they get away with that? The, the market would tell, you know, I'll tell you this, the traditional OEMs look at it and they scoff at it. They just say it's, you know, it's not very good uh, until you look at the numbers that you posted, John, on a recent uh, uh, financial analysis that you did on the companies and looks like they're doing darn good. So uh, it, it's an area of, of continued improvement and growth. And I, I believe one time Elon said something about I can build one of anything, but the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is volume production. And I believe that wholeheartedly. It is really hard to make one a minute and make them perfect. So, so Gary, can I just give you a little different point of view, please? Go Gary. ahead. Yeah. So, uh, so, it, you know, so the IQS score from JD Power, of course, is a good metric. But uh, and at the same time, contrast that with Tesla was the best-selling vehicle just recently in the world, okay, even beating the Corolla. So the Tesla buyer, uh, for them, is the IQ score most important or the fact that the techn technology in the vehicle is continuously improving. You know, if you want quality, uh, you, uh, you don't want to change many things, okay, and that's part of the Toyota system, right? You limit your number of changes so that you can get the quality up and so on. So that you look at it from the minds of the customer saying, yes, uh, is uh, do the, the customer customers today, are they looking for change and more innovation and so on and so forth? And if that's what, that's what Tesla is known for, they're willing to give up on some of these other elements. Okay. So I'll just give you two contrary views. My wife would definitely like the IQS vehicle, but my son, always wants he started driving recently and he's always wanting to try new technology things so i i don't think he would care about the iq score one bit okay so it all depends on the consumers and uh, so uh, the rules of the game have changed so what was important before is not important today and that's what's happening and are we caught in the legacy that's the question yeah that's a really good point i mean uh jd power is counting things gone wrong uh, but then there's the things gone right, right. and, uh, you know, it's up to the consumer to decide, you know, does does the good out, uh, outweigh the bad? Uh, but I don't want to get caught up in, in debating uh, J.D. Power IQS. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get back to uh, what we're talking about here. Um, Sean, I don't know if you've got that bi battery structure. I think it was page 11, if you could bring that up, because I got a question for both Matthew and Terry on this one. And that's when... Uh, uh, Matthew, you had pointed this out. When you tear apart the, the Tesla pack, you find this uh, pink foam inside, which you say is uh, SpaceX material. W what's that all about? And then I got a follow-up question on, on it as well. I, I recommend that Terry answer this question. Okay, go ahead. Terry. <laughs> better than I can. I would recommend Elon Musk answer this question. <laughs> uh, uh, this is, uh, you can see the, the, the uh, battery pack with the top having been literally ripped off, uh, which it's not easy to disassemble these batteries. It's quite a chore. Um, but once you do, and you see that it's absolutely, totally filled, uh, every uh, you know, uh, void at all is filled with this this foam. And we understand that the foam is a structural foam that they actually use in the, the SpaceX uh, craft. It is, uh, it sets up like concrete, but it weighs like dust. Uh, 
it is quite remarkable. And in order to get these cells apart, because we wanted to benchmark this and tear this thing down to the very cells, down to the chemistry, uh, it was incredibly difficult to get this foam out. We tried chemical attacks. We tried dry ice shot painting. We tried everything to, to get it apart and, uh, and it would just work away at it. So uh, what they've done is by doing this, you know, they've made a very structural pack. Uh, you push on one side, it's coming out the other side. It is just extremely uh, structurally tight. The reason they did that is somewhat speculative. Did they do it for structure? Did they do it because they had uh, thermal issues? Is, uh, and will it remain there? Uh, that's to be seen. I don't know that it will always be there. If it was as a countermeasure to another problem that they would get at in another way, they'll, they'll be doing that. One thing about Tesla guys is to stay up to speed on their on their designs is to tear one down about every six months, because I guarantee you it'll be different. And there's always something new, something learning. And, and Matthew had mentioned, you know, legacy OEMs uh, enemy is a, is uh, or, or change is a is an enemy to quality. Change is a threat. Well, they just they they don't accept that. They just change as soon as they think they can implement something that's better, and you know do their due diligence to make sure that it, it doesn't cause problems and and that's what we saw so so this was a new uh, learning when we tore the last one down it was there uh, we'll see if it stays but uh, pretty incredible yeah I, look i think it's a mistake on their part from one standpoint recycling i was at a recycling plant earlier this month and oh they were complaining about how hard it is to rip these battery packs out of the car itself and then to rip the battery part pack apart and then to get down to the cells, it, it, it's a real headache for them. So I think Absolutely. Tesla and all the others are doing a great job of designing for assembly, but not designing for disassembly. But exactly. that, that, that's just me on my soapbox for one second here. What I want you guys to talk about is uh, how they do design changes on the fly. I mean, this is verboten in the auto industry, right? Thou shalt not make design changes on the fly. And it all harkens back to the, the Toyota production system. You freeze specs a year before job one. That way everybody's on the same page. You get your quality right and you don't introduce any design changes unless there's a major problem until two years after job one. That way you can make sure that you keep your quality top notch. But Tesla is able to do these design changes on the fly. It runs into some problems sometimes, but more often than not, they get it right. How? Is it because they've got a software defined car? Is it because they can test this out with digital twins? Matthew, what would your, your advice be to the, to the legacies? How do they keep up with this company that's changing so quickly? Well, well, the, um, well a couple of things, gentlemen, you alluded to it. One is uh, they're, they're always looking for technologically better ways uh, to do things, which so, for example, if you look at this phone here of mine, um, it's a, it's a, it's a convergence, right? It's a, it's a phone, it's an email device, it's a camera, it's a compass, it's a GPS, it's so many things. So Tesla is continuously looking at it from a technology standpoint. And there was an update from Apple this week. You know, it happened overnight, OTA updates and so on. So change is part of the system. And that's cultural mindset. It's a technology device. You need to continuously keep updating it. So how do they enable it? What we have heard is uh, uh, one is they do a lot more virtual simulation than legacy OEMs. Uh, we have had uh, retired Tesla experts work with us, and uh, they rely a lot more on the digital virtual models than legacy OEMs do. So they say, okay, here's the model. It works in the virtual model. Now build the car like the model, not the other way around. That's one example. Second example, second uh, uh, second point to think about is uh, from a capital perspective. Uh, whenever there's a change, uh, they look at the change. Uh, we've spoken to a few Tesla people. They say, hey, this is a new idea. If you had an old idea and you made an investment of a million dollars, that is some cost. Now, if you come back and say, okay, I have a better idea, which will save me more money and better performance for this lower cost. Now let's go look at it. So the barriers to change are less and the old rules are different because they think like a tech company. They don't think like an automotive company and change is good. Good change is good. And that's kind of the mindset. So it's a, it's a shift in mindset. And like Terry talked about the cross car beam, it's a shift in mindset. I'm not dealing with a 40 Hertz frequency that I have to meet, hey, this is just a motor that hums. 
it's all about the mindset and if you're open to change you will change because uh, 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 nobody nobody talks about uh, the, you know Toyota or the legacy OEMs anymore everybody talks about Tesla and the startups so it's uh, it's a different mindset because they change and they're innovating constantly so that's why we talk about that yeah. so so how is it that a legacy car company doesn't just simply catch up to Tesla but actually leapfrog Tesla Okay, so it's a very, uh, a very, very important question. So let's look at uh, the legacy companies, uh, uh, sorry, the new companies. So if you take Tesla, the, the leader is a technologist, Lucid. The leader is Peter Rawlinson, who's a technologist. If you to go talk to Peter, and I've spoken to him, if you get him started to talk about his Sapphire motor, he will not stop. He's just so passionate and excited. <laughs> Same thing with RJ. If you meet with him, he's so passionate. You talk to He Xiaopeng, the head of Xiaopeng Internet Entrepreneur, Bin Li, Neo, the BYD head. These are all our customers. I've spoken to them. They're very, very passionate about technology. If the rules of the game are that technology leads, how can an MBA or a business person or somebody else win because technology is a game changer so uh, and so on and so forth so now of course now a lot of uh, ceos like uh, uh, say uh, uh, talk about uh, you know when i talk to several ceos and legacy oems they're very very focused on technology they're bringing technologists in from uh, from silicon valley and so on that's very very positive because that's what legacy auto automakers need to do to you know, leapfrog into this new area. Will they truly uh, be able to leapfrog the legacy OEM, uh, the uh, startups? I don't know because the advantage of the legacy OEMs is 100 years of, 100 years, what are the advantages of legacy? 100 years of history, 100 years of experience and being a big company. But for a startup, uh, for a company like Tesla, capital is not an issue. So what competitive advantages do you have? You have to evaluate it. You know, it's not a question of saying legacy versus startup says, hey, what specific competitive advantages do you have that makes you feel that you could leapfrog and beat Tesla? So uh, uh, it's mainly technology and let the best man or woman or the best person win. That's, that's, uh, uh, that's, that's what I would say. It's real good. Hey, look, we're, we're at the top of the hour here, a little beyond even. We're going to have to wrap it up. But you guys, this has been fascinating. And and I, I've got a whole list of things here <laughs> that I wanted to get to, and we didn't get to them all. So we're going to have to have you back because uh, your findings and especially your insight. You know, Matthew, I think you've nailed it. You can collect all kinds of data and present it, but you guys go beyond that. You talk about, you know, new organizational structures. You talk about new kinds of leadership. You talk about cultural change and, and you're providing solutions. You're providing knowledge. You're providing, you know, a guide path as to what companies have to do. So I, I, I find that just terrific. And uh, I, I hate that we're going to have to cut this off now, but this will be continued. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Look forward to it. Look good. Absolutely. Always, always a pleasure. Thanks, Joyce. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for hosting us, John. And you bet. Thank you. Yeah, you, you bet. And, and thanks for everybody who has tuned in. Yeah, thank you. Good. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey. If you like this program and would like to learn more about the automotive industry, check out our website at autoline.tv or look for us on YouTube on the Autoline channel.